this is about a challenge, a call. And uh, that's what I want to kind of think about. Okay, what can you do? And I think sometimes people, I don't know what to do, how to, how to contribute to this. So what, what we're going to have here is uh, something called a f exploring effectiveness, a unique response to God's unique call. I don't think all of you are going to do the same thing. I don't think all of us have to respond in the same way. But we probably have to do something. You know, you think there's a kind of a sacrifice involved in reaching the world. And this, this wasn't on my script, so I'm going to go off script here, and so I hope this works. But did you hear the epistle lesson this morning? There, it was talking about Paul and Timothy, and Paul asked Timothy to do something. Did anybody hear that? He asked Timothy to get circumcised. Now, I'm not going to get too graphic here. <laughs> we were talking about new wineskins. We're talking about something else here. <laughs> but think about it. Think about it. Why in the world would Paul ask Timothy to get circumcised? It's to fit in with the Jews. And we're complaining because we're getting on Twitter. <laughs> or becoming on Facebook. That's not much of a sacrifice, is it? I think Paul understood sometimes what we don't understand, is how if we want, we need to be willing to make some external changes in order that that's, this internal message can be heard. And Paul knew that, I don't, and I don't know how they know, I don't know how they figure this out, but he knew that his credibility would be affected in a positive way if he did that. So I think we need to kind of keep that in mind. This, uh, we may have to make some sacrifices or some changes for this newness to come. And new means change. And change is hard. I don't care what kind of change it is. So, so that's kind of a beginning here. If you want to make a contribution, if you want to respond to the call, it is likely to mean some kind of change for you. Talk about Facebook. I'm on Facebook. And if you want to see my grandkids, all you need to do is make me a friend, and you'll probably get sick of seeing my grandkids, because that's, that's mostly what I do on Facebook. But I have another friend on Facebook who posted this quote, and I don't think that's just an accident. I think that's a God thing. I think uh, this person knew that what I was going to be talking about, or God knew. And it's, it's from an author by the name of Timothy Keller. He's a, he's a pastor, and he writes lots of books. But uh, I think this is a great quote here, and I'm going to have to look behind since I don't have it here. The call of God is absolute great. It doesn't come because you're qualified. You're qualified because you're called. Do you hear that? God doesn't call you because you're qualified. He doesn't kind of look around and say, okay, I'll take them and I'll take them. He just says, come and go. And when he says come and go, you're qualified. You've got something. He made you. He knows you. And he doesn't call people who he does not think are qualified. And this is, the, I, I just wanted to remind us what the calls are. And I don't think... This is a new evangelism, but you know what? It's not new. It's the same evangelism that started here at the Great Commission. Teacher, which are, are not the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. I think it's the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. You know? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart. You know, that heart, that's what it takes to be a witness. It's got to be inside you. You can't fake it. Uh, with all of your soul and with all of your mind, this is the first commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So that is the, 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 the great commandment. That's a call. That's, I think, what God is continually asking us to do. And then, then the great commission. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. It sounds like you might have talked about that last night. Uh, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we're called to love and to be witnesses to the gospel, every one of us. And those whom he calls, he equips. You're qualified. 
Stop waiting around till you get the right qualifications. You are qualified. I think the important thing is, though, sometimes we don't know what our qualifications are. And here's the thing. We don't all have the same qualifications. They're different. But knowing what they are may be what it takes to kind of get you moving, to help you to realize that you have something to offer. Um, as we're going to be exploring our effectiveness. As followers of Christ, members of the body, we're called to be loving witness. I already said that. Okay. And here, here's, here's this other thing. I just want to remind us. It's okay to explore. Some people think this might be a waste of time. Why are we doing this? Because I think we our calling and our qualifications are together. To some degree, our design is a a prelude to the spiritual destiny that we might have, what God might want us to do. It's, you don't have to look around, you have to look inside. Here's what I'm going to, would like to have you lead some thinking in about, and in fact, I'm going to have you talk a little bit to each other, just to kind of break it up so you don't have to listen to me. Uh, which of my natural abilities could be used in this role? And that usually has to do with your signature themes. What are you good at? And I'm going to just go through these quickly, but we'll drill into each of these individually. So the first one is your abilities. Also, what are my vulnerabilities? Which is, that is, how might my dominant themes occasionally be misunderstood or labeled in a negative way by others? In other words, sometimes the things that drive you, drives other people crazy about you is not what you are, not, it's who you are. Right? Yeah, it's not about what's missing, it's what you are in spades that drives people crazy sometimes. And that can be a vulnerability that you have to be aware of. I'm not suggesting that you become a different person, but you got to get better. you got to get better at who you are. If we want to be better as a church, that means all of us have to get better to some degree. What are my liabilities and disabilities? That is, what abilities are either absent or unnaturally unnatural for me, but requirements of my role? Just like now, I don't have adaptability. Guess what? I have to be adaptable. I have to figure out how to do it because that's the way life is. It, it's, it's not about what your themes are. You, you have to have another plan. Uh, what things give me credibility? That's exactly what I was talking about with Paul and Timothy. T Credibility is about external stuff. It's about degrees. Some people need to get a degree. Some people have experiences that give them credibility. I think some people speak different languages. With some groups, that's going to give you credibility. Technology could be a form of credibility. People will listen to you because you tweet or because you do that. There's lots of different ways that you can have credibility. And finally, where and with whom am I most compatible? This could be about the people that you reach or the people you partner with, people who can help you. So that's kind of an overview. So I want to just start here. Actually, there's a, the, I want to go to this slide first because I think this is sometimes a problem. When I work with faith-based groups, and I was uh, in Colorado Springs earlier this week working with a Christian organization called Compassion International. They kind of uh, raise support for p children in poverty. But the, the virtue of humility is kind of a problem sometimes. And I, here's the reason why. I think sometimes people think that the, the opposite of, of arrogance is humility. I'm either arrogant or I'm humble. And I don't want to be arrogant, so I'm going to be humble. And I think sometimes we think that humble means I really can't do anything. I really don't know anything. I have nothing, nothing to offer. When in reality, it's, it's not hum humility, it's, it's uh, ignorance. But arrogance says, and you might know some people like this. It's not this, any, no one in this group would probably say that, but I know everything, I can do everything, I don't need anybody, I am self-sufficient. I am kind of a one-man band or a one-woman band. I, independent. Um, Ignorance says, and you might know some people like this as well, I know nothing, I can do nothing, I am helpless, and I am useless. Now, I think humility is right in the middle of those two things. And I want to be humble today. And so this is what I'm going to say. I know some things, and I don't know some things. 
I know a lot about Strength Finder, but there's a lot of other stuff in this world I don't have a clue about. Uh, I can do some things, and I can't do some things. I couldn't do probably some of the technological stuff that Jason could do. Or there's probably some of you who are great at fixing cars in this room. I wish I knew you better and you were a neighbor. <laughs> um, I can give help and I need help. I, I think that's what humility is. And I think sometimes we think humility is I, I really can't do anything. And here's the thing. When you start saying you can't do anything, that's when I think the church is in trouble. If you don't know what you have to offer. We're not saying you have to have everything. But I think you all have something that gives you pleasure, that you do with ease, with excellence and enjoyment. And, and uh, so that's really what this is about. So, so let's think about this first one here. I'm just going to read these off, and then I'm going to give you some instructions. Without using strength, just forget about strength finders for a while. Can you do that? Just wipe strength finders out of your mind for a while and uh, describe your th strengths. What are the areas that you have taken your talent, added knowledge and skill? Uh, in other words, if someone were going to say something nice about you, what would they say? Let's just have it come out of their mouth. What has been some feedback that other people... Now, people have said this to me. I, I lead seminars, and they have to evaluate me, and they write things, so I, I can read these. And some of the things that people often say about me is that I'm authentic. That's, that's a compliment to me. I'm, that's part of what it means to be a relator. We're kind of comfortable being real. Like, this is kind of how, who I am if you would see me at home with my grandkids. This is kind of what I look like then, too. It's not much different. So what do you think people would say about you? And I'm going to have, I want everybody to kind of buddy up with somebody. And what, what do you think people say you're good at? What have people said that you're good at? Remember, humility does not mean you're not good at anything. It means you're probably good at something. Right, whoever you're sitting next to, buddy up, take a couple minutes. Let's get some examples of what people are good at. What are you good at? people say they were good at? I'm not going to say you say your own. What did you hear other people say they were good at? That they were considered compassionate. Compassionate, absolutely. That's, that's a strength. That's a, it's not a theme, it's a strength. And there are probably themes that lead to that, but compassion, yes. She's a welcoming person. She's a welcoming person. Ah, that's slightly different, isn't it? It's come in. The, the, you might have some includer. Who knows? Yes. Patience. Patience. Oh, yeah. Patience. You know the gift of patience is? It's really giving people time. I think it's, it's about giving people time. I mean, impatient means let's go. But patient is willing to wait. Give people time. That's a great one. Some of, how about some more? Good on follow through. Good on follow through. Yeah, yeah. Boy, that getting the job done. I said I'm going to do it, that I'll do it. Absolutely. Yes. Helpful. Helpful. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's, I think, I, wanting to help other people, I think, is a, a natural capacity that some people have more. That doesn't mean that the rest of you are bad people, but that there is some people who are just more helpful. They get a lot of pleasure. How about some other ones? Very caring. Caring. Okay, good. Any, any other ones besides the one we've heard here? Um, Christine said she's open. She's able to make her own decisions, has her own opinions, but is open to other ideas. Okay, yeah, an openness of mind, a willingness to listen. Good. Somebody else had a hand up over here? Yeah, a great friend. Friend. Yeah, absolutely. Oop. Somebody have a hand up here? Organize. Organize. Boy, we need... Interesting fact here, folks. Any of you in the room have discipline? That's what I thought. Not many. 
and you probably have it in your next five, I'm guessing here. Discipline is one of the least frequent themes. We've got seven million people who've taken the Strengths Finder, and people with discipline are kind of organized. They have kind of a detail oriented to them. They, they keep their ducks in a row, if you know what I mean. So good. Somebody had a hand up over here. She speaks with conviction. Conviction. Oh, yeah. Belief. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. She's the bright light in a room. <laughs> bright light in a room. Yeah, kind of lights a room up. I like it when there's light in a room. Thank you for being here. Somebody else have a? Empathy. Yeah, empathy. Yeah, that's a theme and a strength almost at the same time. Yes. Good leadership and compassion. Leadership and compassion. What a great combination. What a great combination. Back here. We don't want to make... I'm going to get my exercise after sitting all morning. This is good. Resourceful and, uh, and the willingness to uh, jump into doing anything to be helpful. Okay, resourceful. Yeah. You know, that's lots of... Street. You know what I noticed about the room when we started talking about what we can do, what we're good at? There was an energy in here that's, that's gone right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> when you're talking about what it is that you do best, the, the, it creates an energy. And you know what? If we're going to change the world, it's going to take energy. Nothing moves unless something moves. And so one of the greatest sources of energy, I mean, I think talent may be one of the greatest, greatest sources of sustainable, natural energy. Think about that. Now, I was having a discussion with a, a, a person in the room over the lunch hour. I was telling him I'd read that we have like 120 years left of oil resources. Now, he was saying that may not be right, but I'm going to just, let's just pretend it is. For my, so, we might run out of oil, but we're not going to run out of human talent. It is a sustainable natural energy. When you have a natural capacity for doing something, you do it, number one, with ease. It comes easy to you. And that's important. It comes uh, with, you usually do it better. And here's the third thing that I think kind of brings some energy as well. It's usually fun. When you do what you do naturally, it comes easier, you do it well, and it's more fun. There's some other things up here I just want to kind of run by you. Um, what are you known for? What words or phrases would be inscribed on the basis of a statue of you? I know you don't want a statue. That's okay. But if there were one, what would they write on the bottom of it? Uh, what are the elements of your work that you consistently do with ease, excellence, and enjoyment? When you think about a good day, what are you doing? I think that's a clue to, to what it is that you might do most naturally. Uh, what is one of your natural abilities that seems to be underutilized? What words are frequently used by those who give positive feedback in your performance? Describe the recent growth of one of your natural abilities. Uh, what internal or external factors precipitated or facilitated your growth? And where is an area where you reliably produce results? I think we ought to think about our abilities, what we're good at, and do more of that. If all of us were bringing our best stuff to our parishes, the church would get better. And I think that's what uh, I heard the Archbishop say was needed. So it looks like most of you have taken Strengths Finder. I want you to talk to three people, and I want you to talk about the theme that you love. Out of your signature themes, this is the theme that is my favorite. I love it. It's, it I'm proud of it. I wear this proudly on my name tag, and here's why. Stand up. Stand up and move around a little bit. Here's the one of my themes that I love. Maybe you don't know much about it. Maybe it's just the name you like. I don't care. Okay. 
Thank you. Abilities and strength finder themes are similar, but they're not exactly the same. They, they might give you, I had a person up front here was talking to me. She hadn't done the strength finder, but she told me what she liked to do. She said, I really like to, I like to work with marginalized people. People who are kind of the outside. And I got a feeling if she took the strength finder, I might know what her theme would be. But I think uh, she, and, and sometimes with that theme, people who have experienced marginalization still understand what, what it looks like to be marginalized. That's why they're sensitive to this, because they've actually experienced it sometimes. That's how we become who we are. Part of it is genetic, but a part of it is, is, how, is what experience we had younger in our lives. It's our early life, the shaping that brings us to be. And sometimes the things that happen to us are not good things. Sometimes they're painful things that cause us to be who we are. It reminds me in the, uh, the Old Testament, this, the story of Joseph and his brothers and how his brothers were jealous of him and they kind of got rid of him. They kind of threw him in a pit and eventually sold him and he, they thought he was, out of, he was out of the picture. Well, anyway, they kind of connect later on in Egypt and, and he, he kind of plays with them a little bit and they thought, oh boy, our goose is cooked here. He's going to get rid of us now that we did it to him. And at the end of the story... I love the line where he says, you meant it for evil, but God used it for good. I think that's part of how we become who we are, is the experiences of life, they could make us bitter, or they could make us better. And I think in, in this case, it sounds like this is somebody who's experienced that, but is now working to help it so that people who are, who are outside can be on the inside. Okay, we're going to shift gears a bit now. We've thought about our abilities, and I don't know if you get clear about your abilities, uh, I, we're going to, I think, make these PowerPoints available to you. So if you want to uh, get, a, get these and look at these questions more closely, you can do it. But I just wanted to just kind of go through it. Um, how might my dominant themes occasionally hinder my effectiveness or cause me to be misunderstood or labeled in a negative way by others? And this is the crazy effect. Sometimes who I am can drive other people crazy. And how is that? I want to, people often like to talk about this, vulnerabilities. Yeah, and usually they like to talk about other people's craziness. <laughs> it's not my own vulnerability, it's someone else's vulnerability. I'm really aware of their vulnerability. So um, I got to get this quicker. It's, it's living in the basement. It's, uh, I think we, we all have these themes, but here's the thing with these themes. You can either be in the basement or the balcony. And I think to some degree, I don't know about your basement. I don't even have a basement in my house, but when I was a kid, I had a basement in my house. And uh, before, I, when I was little, it was unfinished. But when, when my, my family grew, I was the oldest son. And so my dad refinished the basement and he... Uh, said, well, you're the oldest son, I guess you're going to have a bedroom in the basement. It was a beautiful basement. It had kind of like knotty pine on the walls, and it had nice carpet on the floor. So I moved to the basement, and I remember, I think I might have been I think eight or nine years old, and I remember the first night that I was in the basement. <laughs> Whew. I thought I was blind. My dad kissed me. We said their prayers, shut the light off, and whoa! <laughs> It's, it, was, it was dark down there. And I think uh, to some degree there are, even in our, the best parts of it, there can be a negativity associated with. And uh, even though God gave us these natural abilities, sometimes they don't work right. And I think there's some reasons why they don't. I kind of want to go through some of these a little. Some talents are dark because they're immature. A theme that has not evolved into a strength yet. I, I've noticed as I've talked with all kinds of people, all ages of people, that there's something that I call a raw talent. I was just thinking about uh, the young man who was kind of the MC. What's his name? John. John? Yeah. I bet when he was a kid in school, the teacher told him, John, would you shut up, sit down and shut up? <laughs> sit down and shut up. Now... John gets invited to stand up and talk. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Raw talent gets a little bit more mature, doesn't it? 
So that's part of why sometimes our talents drive other people crazy. If you've got kids, I bet they drive you crazy sometimes. They're not done yet. They're raw. We have to be patient. You know, whoever's patient back there, there's a place for patience. It's wait, giving time for people to get to grown up. I, I think it takes time. My, I just, my, uh, my daughter-in-law and my son had a, a new baby. It seems like it was only yesterday. It's been 20 months ago. I have a 20-month-old granddaughter. I wish I had a picture. I should have put one. But anyway, I know that my daughter-in-law would have loved to have had a six-month pregnancy. But it takes nine months. It takes nine months. It takes time. And I think a lot of times what we're trying to do is compress the time that it takes for development. I think the same thing is true for spiritual development. Sometimes we want our kids to be as spiritually mature as we are, and we've had 20, 30, 40 years on them. How can that be? So part of the reason sometimes we, we look at people and we say, boy, I sure don't see that theme. It may be because it's not mature yet. It needs time. That's certainly one ingredient that it might take. Uh, here might be another reason. A theme that has not been productively applied. Someone who, who doesn't quite know how to use it yet. Maybe he's not in a role where it's valued. Maybe there's someone who has futuristic and they're not any place where they have any opportunity to, to think about the future. So they kind of get in places where what they have not, is not really valued. Uh, a theme that has been thwarted or impeded. That happens a lot, especially in families, where we think our kids should be like us. And guess what? They may or may not be like you. They may have a kind of a genetic similarity to you, but remember what I said? The odds of someone being exactly like you are 1 in 33 million. You'd have to have a lot of kids to get your clone. <laughs> But I think sometimes these, these themes are kind of repressed. We, uh, we, we, we sometimes try to create people in our own image rather than realizing they've been created in God's image and looking inside them for who they could be. And don't get me, I'm not trying to be judgmental here of parents because I've been a parent and I'm a grandparent or grandparent and I really prefer being a grandparent to tell you the truth. But anyway, it's hard. Because who somebody is, is internal and invisible. You, I can't just look at you and know who you are. So how do we help people become who they are if it's invisible? And I think that's how the Strengths Finder can help. It can give us some clues. Now there's some other clues as well. I mean, when you watch your kids, you see where they really light up when they do something. They've got this yearning. That's a clue. You ought to pay attention to that. Or you see them have some excellence in doing something, some success. You probably ought to watch that. That's a clue to what they might be good at. Uh, but it could be about a theme that's been thwarted or impeded. Um, a theme that was wasted or misused could be another reason for the basement. A theme that has become an idol. Now, what do I mean by that? Sometimes people get stuck in a rut. You know, you've got five themes, but people only use one theme. They only use one. They become kind of one-dimensional people. They think of themselves only as being one thing. So those are all kind of things that kind of get people into the basement. Now, I'll, this, is a, this is something new for me. I've not talked about this before. I think a great metaphor for talent is crude oil. You don't seem impressed. <laughs> uh, actually, it, 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 here's the thing about crude oil that I realized. It's valuable. I mean, I pay a lot for gas, and gas comes from crude oil. But crude oil, I think, is like $100 a barrel. I don't know if you've seen this stuff. It's kind of black and gooey, and it's, it's crude oil. Crude oil is valuable, but here's the thing about crude oil. It's valuable, but it's not useful yet. If you put crude oil in your car, I think things would get goofed up pretty fast. It wouldn't work. It's valuable, but it's not useful yet. What, ha what needs to happen for crude oil, valuable crude oil, to become useful? 
Refined, yeah, refining. And I didn't really know much about refining, and so, of course, I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> and I found out that uh, crude oil must be refined, and that apparently is what a refinery looks like. Have any of you ever seen a refinery? <laughs> you have a refinery here? <laughs> Gee whiz. I didn't know that. Well, I, I, I'm going to get a tour of the city today. I need to see the refinery. <laughs> this is the perfect place for me to try this new material out. <laughs> um, so, transforming our raw talents into useful strengths is like refining crude oil. The refining process involves both extractions of impurities and infusion of necessary additives. Like crude oil, talent without refinement has potential value but remains useless. But without crude oil, the refining process is unnecessary. If, if there was no oil, we wouldn't need refineries. And if there was no talent, we wouldn't need ways to develop people. So it's about extracting impurities. Even in your strengths, these talents that you have, there are some impurities. I mean, part of it is just sin. <laughs> We're, we're sinful human beings. That we have to kind of own that, and that gets in the way. Uh, necessary additives. I think there's lots of additives that we need to add to talent to make it become a strength. Experience, humility, knowing what you have, what you don't have, uh, knowledge, and the Spirit. I mean, I think the Spirit of God is one of the in infusions that I think adds value to this. Okay, I want to just take a little time for you to, this is not as much fun, obviously, but I want you to think about your themes again for those of you who know them. Which of your themes can drive you or somebody else crazy? And I'll, I'll go first here. I'll go first. One of my themes is responsibility. Why is that funny? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we'll talk later. And here's how responsibility gets me in trouble. Now, you think about responsibility, what we're good at is responding to other people. We like to help people. Someone mentioned that. And so we like to help people, and we're, we're responsive. So when someone say, hey, can you do this? Our immediate reaction is say, yes. Yes. We're good at saying yes, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. I, I said yes to come here. That was a good thing. But sometimes we say yes too quickly, or sometimes we say yes too much. If I know, when I think about high responsibility people, I know that their plate is usually quite full. And here's the thing, if your plate is full, and you say one more yes, something falls off the other side. And what falls off the other side is usually you. Now, this may not be a very good place for me to talk about that. We're talking about a challenge that the parish and the, the archdiocese needs to meet here. It means doing stuff. But, so I'm not saying, don't stop saying yes, folks. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is, how do I get better at saying yes? That's different than saying, okay, I'm not going to say yes anymore. How do I get better? Now, here's how I got better at saying yes. I didn't say yes till I asked my wife. <laughs> now, you laugh. You laugh, and it is kind of funny. But in a sense, what it did is it gave me time to think before I said yes. I'm a man. <laughs> You're a man. <laughs> You're a man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's my confession. I have, and I've gotten better at responsibility. I've gotten better. And I still say yes, but my yeses are good yeses. And not yeses at the expense of my own health, my own well-being, and my family's well-being. But I, I, that's part of what makes me good. Is I'm resp when, when you think about that word, it's the ability to respond to others. That's what responsibility is. It's people who are driven by their commitments. 
So you have to be careful you don't overcommit. Make sure your yes is, a, is the best one. So what I do is I add maximizer. That's, remember I talked, think about two themes at a time. Maximizer is the one that says, okay, is this the best commitment? It's a good commitment, but might there be a better thing that you could do? It, it's a more of a discerning yes. Okay, I've confessed my, li my vulnerability. So now let's... Just turn to whoever's sitting next to you and talk about, is there one of your themes that gets you in trouble sometimes, either drives you crazy or somebody else? This is never quite as enthusiastic of a discussion, by the way. <laughs> you seem to have too much fun with that crazy part. I don't know. This is a unique group here. You know, I, th I think sometimes, and I want to get this scripture up here. This is a verse that I think sometimes people think is kind of troubling with regards to this strengths-based approach. And uh, I just want to read it here. Uh, it's from two Cor 2 Corinthians. Uh, but he said to me, and this is Paul speaking, uh, and Paul is kind of interesting. He had what is known a thorn in the flesh. I don't know if that's, but there was something wrong with him. We're not exactly sure what it was, whether it was something with his eyesight or some kind of physical malady or whatever. He called it his thorn in the flesh. And he asked God to take it away a lot of times, but he didn't, apparently. He had to live with this disability, this vulnerability. And uh, uh, this is what he said. My, he said to me, uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, and hardships, and persecutions, and difficult. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, some people take this to mean that I ought to work in my weaknesses. I should be glad I have weaknesses. I don't think that's what this is saying at all. There are some things you can't fix. There are some things about you that you can't fix, but I think we're always trying to do it. And here's the reason I think we do that. If I can fix all my problems, I can be in control of my whole life, I won't need anybody. I think to some degree, we each need to have our own vulnerabilities, our liabilities, and even our disabilities to show that we need each other, to show that we need God. I mean, that's what he was saying. My grace is sufficient for you. So for those of you who think you ought to be going through life working on your weaknesses, that may not be the case. It could be that he's saying, we all have that thorn in the flesh so that we'll be depending on God and others. Okay. And, and I think that really gets me to this point. Our weakness, that is, our natural liabilities and disabilities prompt us to uh, rely on God and others. And I call this the, so, the law of supply and rely. Sometimes I'm the supplier. I have what it takes. I can make contributions to things. But you know what? There are other places that I don't have what's needed. I, one of the best ways to deal with the shortcoming that we have is to ask somebody else, can you help me? It's about partnerships. It's about working with people. And so if, 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 we, if we think we have to be perfect, if we think we have to be good at everything, I think we are missing God's plan for the church. It's the body of Christ. I mean, when you think about the, the image in, in 1 Corinthians 12 where the body is used as a metaphor for the church, you know, you don't hear an eye saying, boy, I'm really bad at hearing. I need to work on my hearing. I, I, I just can see wonderfully, but I cannot hear a thing. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? We don't expect an eye to be good at hearing. And some of you are good at this, but you're not good at that. And you're mostly aware of what you're not good at instead of what you are good at. That's not, I don't think, what Scripture teaches. He wants us to, be, to focus on our strengths, what we have to offer, and not, not be oblivious to what we're not. I think that's part of humility. I know what I am, and I know what I'm not. And both are true. Both are true. Here's the, uh, the other thing, and this is not about your talent. 
This is the, the other thing that I think equips you to be influential with other people, to be a witness, to be someone who, who responds to the great call, the commandment and the great commission here. What gives you credibility? And that's what I was talking about with Paul and Timothy. Pimoth, Timothy took an act that made him more credible with his audience, and I'm not suggesting that for anybody here. What makes you new, uniquely credible? What has others... What do others believe that you will deliver the results that you promise? What, some of you might have academic credentials. Maybe you went to school. Maybe you have degrees uh, or, or personal credentials. Um, finish this statement. What are the places where you've lived? What are the jobs you've had? What significant life experiences have you had that gave you wisdom, insight, perspective? Maybe some of you have gone through the death of a loved one. That gives you credibility with a certain audience. Maybe some of you have dealt with, uh, successfully with addictions. That gives you credibility with other people. Maybe some of you know French or Spanish or other languages. That gives you credibility. Maybe some of you, like me, are old. That gives you credibility. Maybe some of you are young, not like me. That gives you credibility. What are all the things that you bring to your life that are more these external things, not about who you are as a person, but about your knowledge and skill. Those are all things that God gave you that can help you to take, you can take, it, they can help you be effective. Getting into places where they, uh, where we can, where, where we can be more effective. I, this is an area where I think we can, we might have to do some more things. That's why I think this whole discussion about technology was important. If we want to reach people where they are at, that's where they're at. I mean, I remember when I was young, we were sending people to Africa, we were sending people to China, and I think we're still doing that. We wanted to take the gospel to where people were at. Today, people are in these digital worlds, and so that's, that's new to us, just like Africa was kind of new to me when I was a kid. We still went there, though, didn't we? It's different. So it could be that that may be the sacrifice you have to make as an older generation. Am I willing to sacrifice and get on Facebook? Maybe not. <laughs> but I just want you to see it for what it is. People who pack their bags. I had an aunt who was a missionary to Africa. She went to Sudan. And this was back in the 50s. When you went to the Sudan, you didn't come back next week. That means you went there for two, maybe sometimes three years before you had a furlough. That was a sacrifice, and she did it willingly because that's where the people were at. And it's no different. Now, we, we don't have to sacrifice that much, but we might have to sacrifice some if we want things to change, if we want things to get better. Here's another thing to think about. It's interesting to me that when Jesus sent his disciples out, he often sent them out two by two, a partner. And I think it's, it's, it's probably something we ought to think a little bit more. Who am I better when I'm with them? Who do I team up with well? It's kind of the yin and the yang thing. They're good at this and I'm good at that. So that's part of what compatibility is about. People who really complement each other. I think a great marriage is often that. We complement each other. Uh, my wife and I complement us. I'm kind of a thinker. I, I think a lot. I read a lot. and I have a lot of stuff in my head. She has a thing called activator. Do we have any activators in the room here? Yeah, we got a few. Yeah, not as many as I thought there might be, but uh, we might need you, especially you three who are in here. <laughs> We're going to depend on you a lot. <laughs> Activators are people who said, okay, let's get started. Let's do something. Let's make something happen. Let's get going. They have a kind of a sense of urgency about them. They, they, they're really good at the starting line. And I'm kind of good. Okay, I'm getting ready to get started here. Pretty soon I'm going to get going. And my wife said, let's go. Now, having been married to my wife, I think I have accomplished much more in my life than I would have if I had been alone. I would have never gotten started fast enough. I would have been behind. So, she has blessed me with that ability that God gave her. And maybe God knew we needed each other. But I think the same thing is true not just for marriage. I think 
in the ventures in life that we do. Who, who are we compatible with in terms of partners? But it's also, who are we compatible with in terms of who we might reach? Who might be a person that I might be able to kind of have an influence on because I'm in their neighborhood or because we have these kids the same age? Who's, who's the audience for your witnessing and for your sharing the gospel with? You have something in common with them. That's, I think, what compatible, compatibility is about. So, so those are the things. Abilities, what are you really good at? Uh, uh, vulnerability, what gets you in trouble? Not about what's weak in you, but what's strong in you. What liabilities or disabilities do you have? Where are things that you're really missing something? And credibility. Okay. Okay, get it. Remember, let's kind of start where we started, started at the beginning, and I'm going to give a little time for questions here. Getting clear about our qualifications can help us get clear about our calling or the roles we can play. Remember, we are not called by God because we're qualified. We're qualified because we are called. You're all qualified here. There's no disqualifications. You showed up today. That says to me, these people feel a calling. So I want you to know you walk out of this room qualified. All of your abilities, vulnerabilities, credibilities, know what they are and figure out how to use them. Okay, anybody have any questions about anything related to this area? I don't really want to get into politics here, but anything about strengths? Yes, back here. Thank you. We've done the two groups uh, through the training. Uh -huh. What's the normal drill after that? What, what if you've done 10 groups, how do you put it into motion? Well, I think groups are the beginning. The question was, you know, I think groups are where you learn about these things. This is a tool, I think, that's about, uh, it's about how you live your life and how you do your work. I mean, every day, I think if you got up, you think about, okay, how can I take advantage of what I have? Well, I think, I think this is something that can, doesn't need to just be confined to a strengths group. Hopefully, this is a language that will start to percolate in our board meeting and in our church nursery, where people become aware, more aware of this. It's, it's really something that is integrated into everything you would do. We're really trying to kind of teach a language and a way of thinking that really could, you know, that's really how I see it working. Other questions? Over here. Yes, sir. About an hour and a half ago, we had something to eat, and the lady across the table from me actually explained something that I didn't understand. And many of the people that, that I've seen have connectedness. Connectedness didn't mean anything until she said that's another word for spirituality. Can you expand on that? It really is, I think, a, a theme for many people about uh, how they view the world. It's also kind of a worldview, and obviously some people view the world through a, a kind of a lens of faith. I mean, I see a lot of connectedness, and it's interesting that I think the people who can usually tell you the most about a theme are the people who have them. That's the best way to get information on what a theme looks like from people who have it, but it's really about people who, who, who think holistically is a word that I use sometimes. They think about the bigger picture. They're often doing this, these motions. It's about the, the whole, it's, it's about being a part of humanity. Um, I, I think I had a, um, one of those pairs that I wrote was about a relator and connectedness. And it's really a person who thinks globally. When they often think about things, they don't just think about here, but they think of the, the bigger picture. But I think it often is a a spiritual view of life, and, and I see it a lot in the Roman Catholic Church, to be honest with you. I've, I've been involved in programs like this out in Seattle and down in Southern California and in, in North Carolina. Whenever I have a, a Roman Catholic faith group, connectedness is usually high. And so I think it is a faith perspective. Yes. gentleman's question here. I'm, I'm just wondering, the way I look at discerning among the community in, within our parishes, what I consider, and you've explained it this way too, as God's thumbprint 
on each of us. To me, that also means it can be revealed as God's plan for that parish community. So in your experience, and as a follow-up, really, what's the next best step? Would it be forming pastorates, these small church group meetings that they had at the beginning of the church in the Acts of the Apostles when people gathered in people's homes and prayed and broke bread and taught each other what Jesus said? You know, do you think, and, and yet still being able to speak the language of the strengths that you share and perhaps can work together to create new life in the parish? I, I don't know. I'm just really asking for your experience. On yeah, that. I think that's true. I think sometimes, sometimes we create a plan and then we kind of look for recruits. Uh, it's, I think, the design, the design of a community, the design of a person is, is I mean, that's what it means, I think, if you're, if you're called, you're qualified. God looks down and says, these people, I gave all of these people stuff. They're qualified to do something. And, and I think the, the, the nature and the kind of the design of the person and the community is a clue, I think, to the direction of what we should be doing. Absolutely. What else? Oh, over here. Yeah, um, my question is that most of us, I think, are in parishes, and I think most of us agree there's like a core of 25, 30 percent of the people that are active, engaged, and doing something. And we want to reach out to those 75 percent that are not. So how do we get them to come to know their various weaks and strengths? How do we get them to, say, volunteer or, or take on something that they can become engaged in, that they can feel a sense of community, that they can feel a sense of belonging. Because you're taught, most of us here probably are on some sort of a ministry of some sort or another. So we are actively involved in our parishes. But through what I'm supposed to be getting, I think, from this, is how do we reach out to those others? I think sometimes we, we want other people because we need them. And I think it can't just be that. Well, I think, I, I just think it, it needs, I think you need to, I want to know you, I want to understand you, I, I want to see you. But I think if it's just, we want to know what your strengths are so we can find a place for you to work in the church, I don't think that's going to fly, to be honest with you. It has to be an authentic, I love you. You know, whether you're in here or not, I love you. If somehow people feel that, it's a little bit like, I kind of think about this, I wish I had a kind of blackboard here, um, expectations and appreciation. It's kind of like high expectations and high appreciation. I, I really like you and I really need what you have. When people do that to me, I like to get involved. I, I like you as a person. I love you. I think you're good. I think I could be connected to you, and we need what you've got. That's what I call maximization. There are some places where it says, we really need you, but we don't like you. That's called exploitation. <laughs> then there's another one that's uh, low, uh, high appreciation, low expectations. I really like you, but we don't need you. That's what I call kind of paternalization. It's a little bit like kids feel sometimes. Uh, you're just a kid. You can't do anything yet. But we, you're, you're kind of cute. We like you. That, so I think what, if we can have high expectations for people, for what people are going to do, we have to have high acceptance and appreciation of who they are. And that's, that's I think, the magic of this sometimes. Is sometimes we, I think you have to belong before you behave. I think they were talking about belong, believe, behave. Belonging, I think, is the first step. And that's about knowing and accepting and appreciating and seeing the value in people, not just what they can do, but be. I think being and doing are connected in that way. But I think that's a, that was how I would respond to that. Yes? When we did the Strength Finders, um, Donna gave us an idea of presenting a card to someone who's not necessarily that visible in, in our church community, a card of appreciation, of, of telling them what you noticed, of, of how they helped the community in general. I mean, it's either by maybe just singing out in the, in the congregation versus singing in the choir. Um, something very simple like that can... Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a good example. I mean, in the, in the story that I told at the end, 
is when we start to think there's, this person might be the Messiah. I mean, that's, that's stretching a little bit. No, one, no one's going to be the Messiah but the Messiah. But, you know, when we start to see the fingerprints of God in other people, even people who don't even know they're people of God yet, I think that's sometimes how people become the people of God is when we see it in them first. I see the image of God in you. It's the image that's not in the church yet, but you belong here. You belong in the family because that imprint is going to get clearer, it's going to get bigger, and it's going to get more powerful. Thank you. Okay, I, we're done here. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kurt. Isn't he great?